he is extremely sharp in terms of trying to find that little rabbit hole in the system. And he puts everybody in that prison and around him on edge. You know, you take one of those suspected uh, ringleaders out, the business model doesn't stop. The flow of cocaine is not becoming smaller, it's becoming bigger. The amount of money is not getting smaller, it's getting bigger. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're listening to Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs, and the sins of the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Journalist Jan Mayes, a senior reporter at NRC in Amsterdam, didn't start out as a crime hack, but since he made the transition from his finance beat, he's become one of the best known in the Netherlands. His latest book, The She Damsa Cocaine Mafia, tells the story of a corrupt customs officer, seasoned criminals, and thousands of kilos of coke. While his podcasts, including Cocaine Fever, follow the story of a young criminal who becomes the head of an international mafia and questions what that says about the Netherlands. So what does the changing underworld say about both his native country and mine? And are we as journalists equipped to deal with a new breed of gangster who has simply no regard for the structures that uphold our societies? Today, in my second dispatch from the Marengo trial, I'm talking to Jan about the growing threat of organised crime in a Europe that continues to party hard on a diet of cocaine. This is Crime World, a podcast from sundayworld.com. Wow, what a different setting. Yeah. You know each other from Zoom. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> So, right, well, we were there today, and of course we could tell kind of what was happening by the reaction of the journalists. Um, There was a... You were expecting it, because you told me you thought it was going to happen, but everybody was sort of incredulous maybe when they heard it out loud, were they? Yeah, because, you know, you kind of know what's going to happen. He's going to do, you know, he wants to talk about his defence, sensitive issue lawyer arrested, so he's going to request, can we have the doors closed? Doesn't happen that often, but it's it happens mm. uh, in sensitive matters. And then this court is just so... Uh, they're avoiding any type of conflict or issue, and they don't want to give nobody the feeling that they didn't get an honest trial. So, of course, you know, if he says... If it's not closed, I'm not going to say anything. You know, what they're going to do. It's Mm. also, you you know, so it's a balancing act. But then, you know, they make us wait for an hour. And then you get a statement. Yeah, of course, everything was discussed here is behind closed doors. So we can't say anything about it. You know, there's also people for the press from the court. So just, you know, tell us that. (laughs) But so basically they, they... What he said is ultimately he doesn't have his legal team yet. He hasn't no. made a decision yet as whether or not he's going to represent himself or whether. Uh, no, I think he 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 has decided he doesn't want to represent okay. himself, and the court has made clear this is a big case. There is you know a DA who wants you behind bars for the rest of your life, uh, so we want you to have a proper defense. Mm. So that's really uh, their has been their position since. His previous uh, lawyer, Ines Veski, got arrested in April. And But it's apparently just hard to find uh, a new lawyer. And there was one lawyer who announced a couple of weeks ago in an interview in the newspaper that he was going to represent, uh, represent Tahi. Mm-hmm. But then he did not file formally that he is the new lawyer of Tahi. So the court says, yeah, if somebody's not doesn't file no. and then they went something uh, it's, it's legal detail but they went the extra step to actually call a lawyer I mean a court never does who what court calls a lawyer because yeah. he gave an interview in the newspaper you know come to us but they went to him to say listen you know what's your status what's going on and apparently he has said that there is no status and whether this is you know whether this is games uh, for played for whatever reason, I have no clue. Um, but um, 
there is no legal team as of yet. And then there's, you know, before uh, his previous lawyer, Vesky, got arrested, she did, at really at the end of the trial, she did uh, a number of requests. And those requests relate to a story. It's a crazy story. If it's too complicated, let me know. But it's really mm-hmm. a crazy story. There is this, we have this black ops uh, commando team. And there is this one guy, and he's now suspect in uh, a drugs case. And he claims that uh, before Tahi was arrested in Dubai, he was asked if it would be possible for this black ops commando team to have Tahi apprehended by them in Dubai or have, have him basically have him killed in Dubai. Um, this, of course, raises tons of questions. Mm. Is this really true? Who is this guy? Is this legit? Um, and These were supposed to be like a government-sponsored black ops Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, black is, ops yeah, this is a government-sponsored black ops team. And the guy who does this, his, his name is Sil. His first name is Sil. Uh, he is a well-known operative in this world. So he's a, in his, in the world of military police, commando, as far as that goes, he is a very respected person. So there is some reason to, you know, at least listen to him and see what he has to say. But he has become involved in this legal case where he's been accused of, of weapons dealing and, and drug dealing. And the thing is, he has a friend, is a, a friend he knows from his childhood, and that friend became a criminal. Mm-hmm. And he is loosely related to Tahi. So oh, when gosh. that friend was arrested, you know, the headlines were, you know, there is, there is a, a previous commando who was, you know, doing stuff for Tahi. And then if you know that there was a plan to break out Tahi out of jail and they were talking about using commando style uh, people, mm-hmm. everybody linked that together. As far as we know, that that part of the story is just not there. You know, mm-hmm. this guy, this commando or ex-commando, he doesn't know Tahi. And as far as we know, he's never been, uh, you know, they never informed, you know, could you work for us or something like that. But, I mean, the thing is with black ops, they do all off the book. Mm-hmm. So, of course, they also get into the shady territory of international... You know, yeah. How do you get arms? And he was—he told the story that he was working on like a, a training facility in Suriname in Latin America, a, a former colony of the Netherlands. Uh, and so this is just this wild Amazing. story. Uh, and the request that Ines Besky, as you know, did in the defense of Tahi was like, "Listen, we we want to." Uh, hear this guy. We want to interview him, you know, because if this is true, you know, the rights of my clients, blah, blah, blah. Um, so uh, those requests are still pending. So she was arrested after making that request? Yeah, she was arrested two days later and that was, you know, the, the timing of that arrest mm. seems to uh, be coherent with the planning of the court because they had planned to, that, you know, that Friday she got arrested, that, that would be the last day of his trial. And he, you know, over here, you if, if you're the defendant, you get to have the last word. So you get to have the last say in your criminal case. So the idea was that that would be, you know, the, the final mm-hmm. uh, Marengo day for Tahi. But then he, because they did those requests and there was, you know, other, a number of other formal legalities that had to be uh, taken care of. So he said, you know, I don't want to do my last word yet. I might not do it at all. Maybe I want to do it at a later stage. And then, you know, this arrest of Ines Vesky was part of a plan where a couple of other people uh, were arrested. So, um, yeah, they apparently they didn't want to stop it. So, and that's why we're in this legal mess, mess now. Like, the black ops stuff is mad. But then this story, like, I mean, at the same time, it's sort of like you could believe anything at this stage with all this stuff. It's the same in Ireland with a lot of the Kinahan stuff and the Regency and all these crazy things keep happening. And there's been a development of these conspiracy theories because there's so much 
crazy things mm. that seem to be latched on to what happened there. But to sort of stand back, and I'm an outsider here, mm. but I'm looking at this today, and from what I'm talking to people, the chaos of this current position seems to have been because they arrested Ina Zweski. Why couldn't they have left her? Was this a matter of life and death? Why couldn't they have waited until after the trial or left it finish? Those are all good, legitimate questions, but nobody wants to answer them. Mm. So the, o- the only thing that you can think of is, you know, they had planned this uh, arrest of a couple of people. So uh, an- another old associate of Tahi was arrested in the Dominican Republic the week before uh, the arrest of Ines Weski. A nephew of Tahi was arrested on the same Friday as Ines Weski was arrested. And this nephew, his name is Anwar. He's also an, an old, familiar character in this whole mm. story because he has been arrested before in relation to the murder of Dirk Wiesem. Mm. He was a lawyer, and he was the lawyer of the deal witness that mm. you know spilled his beans about Tahi to uh, the police and, uh, and, and the district attorney's office. So... Um, my best guess is that they thought, you know, this is all over. And if there's a little bit of this left, we just have to do what we have to do. And it's more comfortable to think that they had pre-planned this and it was just... Yeah, be, I, yeah. Because I, it's very uncomfortable to think that the other that is possible in this world, surely? Yeah. That, that's true. I mean, the thing is, you know, you have this like cliche, uh, you know, if you make this up for a story and try to make it into a film, nobody will, you know, they'll send you back to the drawing board. Um I mean, we're way past <laughs> that cliche. You know, so much stuff mm. has been going on. You know, I, I, we, were, we were there and I told you, you know, the first like, day that this trial started in March in, in, in this weird courthouse because mm-hmm. you've seen it now. I mean, <laughs> nobody would think, you know, if you're an outsider, nobody would think mm. this is a courthouse. No. Uh, and that's, you know, going on to five and a half, six years that it started. And if you look at what happened ever since, uh, yeah, nothing of this Mm -hmm. would have been, you know, predictable or would have sounded relevant or, you know, imaginable. So three people dead, you Mm -hmm. know, in the circle around a deal witness, um, you know, an an attempt to... um, escape from the only uh, supermax prison we have, um, you know, an attempt to uh, bribe or uh, kidnap uh, wardens of that supermax prison to see if you can Mm. organize your, you know, uh, negotiate your way in and out. What we've forgotten is, you know, there's a threat on the Dutch prime minister. There's a threat on the... Uh, the Members royal family, the royal family yeah. uh, that they could be kidnapped. Mm. Uh, also, as you know, yeah, hostage negotiations is the only thing I can think of. Um, and that those things are not just, you know, like suspicions or uh, like, you know, made up wild theories. But in Belgium, mm. they have tried to kidnap the, the Secretary of Justice. And they were really close. They were there, you know, at 100 meters of his house. And because a few uh, uh, smart neighbors saw this car and they couldn't place it, these guys uh, that, that were there were arrested. And they were Dutch, by mm. the way. Uh, and they had everything you need to kidnap somebody. So that this is not, you know, scenarios in our head, but that they're real in the real world, that's sort of clear. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess this is the crime world in 2024, 23. It is. There's no doubt about that. But interesting a parallel between Taggy and Daniel Kinahan because he created a narrative, a conspiracy theory, shall we say, put it out there in a book, a movie, um, <clears throat> to say that the government of Ireland tried to kill him that mm-hmm. day in the Regency. So is that a mindset? Is it possible that your guy has somehow managed to create this web that looks as if, or that suggests the possibility there was a black ops state-sponsored 
plan to kill him mm-hmm. or yeah I can't go any further now with this because I was going to say or is it possible that there is a state sponsored plan to kill some of these guys that have gone out we have to just go on a holiday this is ridiculous now I, I mean you know, I, if you if I go back I'm to choking you, myself into a into a movie plot yeah. if but if I go back to uh, September 2019 so that's when the country's in shock because there is a lawyer who represents yeah. a deal witness in the biggest trial running at that point, uh, is shot and killed. Mm. And this is not the first killing, this is the second killing, because before there was a brother of this same deal witness who was murdered. A brother, by the way, who had been warning the government for a year, you guys are crazy, you shouldn't do this, you're bringing me and the rest of my family in complete danger. There will be people uh, paying a price for what you're doing. And in the end, that's the sinister backstory. He paid the price. So, but then in September 2019, the country is in total shock. And the main suspect of the biggest court case pending at that point is, you know, he's, he cannot be found for over, you know, two, yeah, a year and a half, two years running. Um, so at that point, if you think about it and you're, you know, you're working for the government and you're thinking about what are we going to do that you sort of in a meeting and have the thought, what are, what are our most extreme options on both sides? That is something else. Talking about that is something else than actually mm-hmm, planning it. Mm-hmm. And, and actually planning it is something else than actually doing it. Those are three really things. But, you know, talking about it is something I, you know, a far-fetched scenario. I can, okay. It's far-fetched, but okay. Mm-hmm. Planning it, the government doing something like that, I would, I would, I would have to see it on paper. I would have to, you know, see it like... A, or hear a recording of that meeting to believe it. Uh, doing it, uh, for me, is out of reach. I, I, I know that's it's totally, I mean, and yet every year that goes by with all this sort of stuff comes something else that you couldn't imagine happening the I previous think, yeah, year. That's true. That's, so, that's, so that's also the, it's the weird and the scary part, you know, because we were there and, you know, it's also when you have a foreigner, you know, foreign eyes with mm. you, new eyes with you, um, you I also tend to look at the scenery for a second time or, you know, the tenth time. And thing. And we were just talking there, like next to these heavily armed guys yeah. with masks on in their uniforms. It's like 25, 30 degrees. They must be sweating their balls off. Mm. And uh, I'm just standing there pretending that they're not there. Mm. I remember going to the first trial where there was military police. I was, I was like, wait, what's going on here? You know, it's like, well, that was intimidating. Just because there was all these people with guns, and I never, I never see guns. I don't know mm. how it is in your no, world. But, we don't. Um, and, you know, so, and then we write about these things, and then you're there, and then when, you know, like the first day of the Tahi trial, that there was actually, you know, military police hanging out of a helicopter, watching him, safely driven into that uh, uh, courthouse. That was also like a scene from a movie. Uh, but then like four years down the line, we're there and you just like, you know, it's like the normalest thing in the world. And that's sort of, that scares me. They're creating because, the new normality, yeah, aren't they? Th- that's sort of scary because mm. that's what it is. Mm. And, you know, and, and, uh, and, yeah, you take all kinds of precautions. You can never that, go back then. No. Once that's done, you sort of cross yeah. that line in the sand and you're on to the next. And then you wonder sometimes, which is really even more uncomfortable, are we equipped to be doing what we're doing now against this sort of thing, you know? Yeah, it's the scary part. And in some ways, you know, if, if, yeah, if they would target you, mm. uh, is there a way to defend yourself? No. I mean, there is, you know, in general, there is some form of system in place that is you know, to be able to react quickly if there's a credible threat. Uh, but if they decide now to take you out and they want to do it tomorrow... Is the state big enough against them, you know? Yeah, no, there, there is no. 
Mm. Um, and I actually, you know, I was, I am, you know, because I knew you were coming here and because there's some other stuff I'm doing, I'm, I'm reading really more closely and, and listening more closely about the Kinahans. Mm. And then, you know, the whole story of Veronica Guerin came back. And actually, in Ireland, it happened. Twenty-five. I mean, mm. that's what ninety-six, ninety-seven. Yeah, 96. it happened. Yeah, it did. They yeah. did it. Yeah. Uh, mm. And maybe because you know the whole IRA history, you guys are a little bit more used to this type of violence than we are. And we had our bout with terrorism, and and in the seventies and in the eighties, um, but not to the level that a journalist was killed. Mm. Because she was doing her work, because that's in the end why she was killed, at least as, as far as I understand the mm -hmm. story. Um, and, but that made me think, geez, yeah, in some ways, you know, the scary part is that in some ways it's not so far-fetched as you think it is. No, and you know it's happened here, of course. We're going to go and see where it happened here as well. But um, yeah, it's uncomfortable to even think about all that. Yeah, we I sort know. of flow through these days and but I mean I think at the same time I think if the state is operating robustly mm. none of these guys are bigger than any state they can't be in this modern Europe we live in they cannot be bigger they have to be I think manhandled more so than maybe our liberal justice system allows and then of course that brings up all sorts of complaints from people and you know um like is taggy is he unique is he is there more of him out there you'd like to think he's unique and like we're sitting there today and he comes up on the screen and he doesn't like he he's he's a normal he's a human being yeah you could pass him on the street. Yep. Is he unique? I think this is, you know, as far as history goes, this is a unique case. Mm. And I've always said, you know, it's going to take a couple of years to really find out and understand whether this was like uh, a very extreme deviation of what is the normal or um, maybe he this case and, and his role in this case has set a new normal. Mm. Um, what is not so unique, and in that sense, Ireland and the Netherlands, you know, have uh, in the history of, of, of the underworld and uh, crime related to, uh, drug related crime, there is quite a bit of parallels. You know, we're mm. Relatively small countries were depending on, you know, trade and, and you know, uh, being, having good relationships with our neighbors. Um, and if you look at how that has helped the underworld in establishing what they have established over the years, then there is a, a number of parallels. And I think the main thing now is that... Um, crime organizations from Ireland and the Netherlands play a huge role in international drug trafficking. And, th I mean, mm. that's the reason why we, we, we talk... We punch above our waist, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the reason why we talk on an office yeah. because there is, you know, this, all these mm. relationships between... So, you know, one of, one of the, 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 the people, the central people in the organization of Tachi was arrested in Dublin. Mm. You know, a number of members of the Kinahan uh, crime group have lived and, and, and operated from the Netherlands. Christy Kinahan himself, mm -hmm. I think, has lived in Amsterdam for a couple of years. Uh, so there is all these links between um, and, you know, what made this big was the cocaine trade. Mm -hmm. In the end, what made this a monster was the cocaine trade. And I have no idea how to, you know, if that, I don't think that is ever going to go away. Mm. And I think, you know, all these groups, they've made so much money. So now I hear stories and see stories that, you know, the port of Rotterdam and Antwerp, they're, you know, they're guarded so heavily now that they, they attract so much attention. Ah, they're going to Sweden. Mm. And I hear, oh, Portugal is a good opportunity as well. But 
that doesn't mean that Dutch criminal groups are not involved anymore or are rooted in the Netherlands. Crime groups rooted in the Netherlands are not involved anymore. They just bring their shit to a different port. Mm -hmm. But the conflict that can arise from all this will still come back to the Netherlands as it does come back to Ireland mm -hmm. all the time. So the fact that it's, you know, that smuggling is not physically or uh, in, you know, uh, your country does not mean that you don't uh, reap the negative benefits mm -hmm. of that crime. And I think, I have a feeling, you know, authorities, they think, oh, we have this big problem, we have to bring it down. And then, so as, as long as we can, you know, prevent them from smuggling through the port, we're good. <laughs> I doubt that. I no, seriously doubt absolutely that. Absolutely not. And, and actually, you know, if you then look... It is at, like that story of the little girl with the, with the figure in the dike, isn't it? Yeah. Was it a little girl or a little boy? Little boy. It was a little boy. <laughs> yeah. It's like and, that. And you know? but I mean, it's, it's really, if you look at the history of the Kinahan clan, mm. I mean, they have been longer in this business than all these guys in the Netherlands. Mm. Um, and so what you see is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, you know, they're always in the core. It's about smuggling drugs, trafficking drugs. And it changes uh, from the outside. So it, it, their business model changes or they have so much money, they've got to invest in something. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it still seems, uh, remains the same. And, you know, if there's conflict, they resolve it by violence. So I'm afraid, you know, what's been going on in Ireland uh, will will stay the same and it, and it will stay the same over here. Did you feel today that I got the sense that the journalist sort of felt, you know, throwing the rise up to heaven, that he had won something? He'd won a little victory. I mean, I was talking to the sketch artist who yeah. said he had his game face on, which I liked. The thought yeah, of it. yeah. Um, he certainly was confident. He was sitting back in the chair. He gave the thumbs up at the end of the, the little visual we had of yeah. him from, from prison. Um, is it a game to him? Do you have any insight into his, the mind of this guy? I find it really hard. I, because, you know, we have... We knew very little about him when his character popped up as a main player in this crime world field. And we, we've heard, he, he doesn't talk. So he, you know, he, he was, as a suspect, he was uh, interviewed by the police a number of times. And what you see there is that he's smart, he's witty, uh, he knows his position. So he said, you know, oh, why don't you just convict me right away and, you know, get rid of all this... You know, I'm just part of your showcase and uh, just hand out the sentence and uh, I'll, do my, uh, I'll do my time. That, so that kind of attitude. But where this all comes from and, you know, how to understand it, I find it really difficult mm. because you really have to get into somebody's head and that's already difficult. But if you, you need to know a lot about somebody before you can do that. And I do think, you know, he... so. He has, since the incident where, you know, they found out that he was plotting uh, a breakout, he has, he has been completely isolated, but he also isolated himself. So, basically, he has no contact with the outside world besides his lawyer. He cannot speak to anybody, he cannot talk to anybody. You mean by his actions he did that? Yeah, yeah. by his, you know, the, mm. the plan to, to mm. try to break out that obviously led to more mm. isolation in the prison he's in. But I think he also isolated himself more. So, yeah, and then, you know, what happens in somebody's mind if, you, you know, he has kids. Mm -hmm. So he is still a father. And I, who am I to judge if he's a good or a bad father? I, just, I think his kids have to do that. But he is not in touch with them anymore. So what does that do if you're in full isolation it's now going on to four years, no, three years. And the only contact is you have on the day is with, you know, a talk with your guards and a phone call with your lawyer, and that's it. For and three he's still years. still surviving and he's still fighting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And yeah. he's still no, so he I mean he's definitely a strong character. Yeah. That that that's no doubt about that. But it also does something to some, some somebody and I find that that's really hard to mm. understand what it exactly does. And what you what I've seen in in files and in court proceedings and in stories I hear from my sources is that he is extremely sharp in terms of trying to find that little rabbit hole mm-hmm. in the system. So, and he puts everybody in that prison and around him on edge mm-hmm. all the time. And, I, you know, sometimes there's this parallel, you know, when you're a parent and you have young kids and you have arguments about screen time and, you know, the hour or the two hours or whatever it is, is up. And, you know, if you're tired and it's like the 10th time and they're asking... And you still have to cook dinner and it's late. And you're like, oh, whatever, just watch. And I'm not wanting to compare him to a child, but what he does is he wears people out. And that at one point they say, you know, this is not allowed, but whatever. And I'll, I'll make it, you know, an example. So if you're in this jail, you can talk to family and people, but everybody has to be screened. So if you want to be on the phone list, Um, you have to be screened. And then if you're screened and if it's okay, you can have a phone call. So if you're in there, you say, okay, I want to call my mother. Then the prison guard dials the number that has been listed for the number uh, for the mother. And then the mother has to pick up the phone and there has to be some form of identification that she's really the mother. And then the phone is handed to him and he can talk with his mother for 10 minutes. What happened a couple of times was that besides the mother, there was also a sister on mm-hmm. the line. Mm-hmm. So what they, they opened you know, a phone and then there was a second phone call. And then guards, as soon as they find out that there is not one but two persons, they have to close down the phone call because it's not allowed. But from what I heard and understand, is it happened numerous times. And it makes me think, okay... You know, those guards, they're on edge, they're worn, they're tired. And they think, oh, what does it matter? Because his mother is on the line, she's screened. His sister is on the line, she's screened. So, does it matter? And that's where, you know, the system sort of cracks and, and he has found his way. He's like mercury, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, and, and, and then he's, he just tries to find his way out. And he is never-ending energy. To fight the system, yeah. to try and yeah. break the system to, to whatever. To, to, to. And the system is almost choosing its battles with them. And in fact, it needs to battle everything with them. But what you saw today was the system mm. saying, okay, yeah. You know, if you want to do this behind closed doors, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Um, and that there is a group of journalists irritated and annoyed, and maybe they're in their right to be irritated and annoyed. Small price to pay. That's how I, I mean, I can't get irritated and annoyed about this anymore. I have, I want to put my energy in other stuff because there's nothing I can, you know. You so it looks like he's about. delayed the case that the, the yeah, that's the October. Definitely, definitely. That much you can kind of say. I would, I would be very, so that, you know, the court plans to uh, read their verdict uh, 20th of October, 22nd of October. Uh, I have my doubts. Mm. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's going to be December or March. Has he looked for the case to be thrown out at all? No, he's never tried that. So well, I, as I said before, he has said, you know, a number of times, you know, why don't you just also against the judge, you know, the, 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 the chairman of the, of the court, you know, why don't you just pull that verdict out of your uh, mm. inner pocket and just read it out to me. And then we know, you know, because we, we know that you're going you're gonna to convict me for life. And reality of the case is, if it comes to the material evidence, he's never answered any questions. So, uh, that uh, you know, if you're a little bit experienced as, uh, as a court watcher, you know that if suspects do that, they don't, they cannot explain away what is all there. So, I think it's fair to say that everybody assumes that he's going to be convicted for life. Mm-hmm. Is there a chance he could walk? No. I have, I have zero doubt about that. Mm. 
Um, and how would somebody like him react to that when the game is up, when it's, he no longer has any more cracks to find? Um, what people are worried about is that, you know, so there's going to be an appeal. Uh, so it's going to take another three years or whatever. And then uh, at one point, when that appeal is up, you're going to go to the highest court, you'll appeal it to... Uh, to Europe, Emily. Uh, and then to Europe. Yeah. But, I mean, that's like really, really far out. Yeah. Um, but then after, you know, so if you look at trials against similar characters, after that appeal is up, then there's an appeal in the high court, but that's all, that's on paper. So there's no sessions, there's no public hearings, there's nothing. Yeah. So at one point, you, you know, so you go to the high court, and then a year or two years later, they've, there's a verdict, and that's it. But then you're out of the public eye. And what people are worried about is that as soon as he is out of the public eye, what will happen then? And I think a lot of people are convinced that they have to keep their guard up. But as soon as you're out of the public eye, keeping your guard up becomes more difficult, especially for somebody who's always looking. And if, if he um, can stay strong, Mentally, um, I think there is people who say, you know, you can never let your guard down. Because then, you know, once you let your guard down, you know, he is in a supermax prison. But uh, the European uh, Treaty uh, for Human Rights says you cannot keep somebody in isolation for the rest of his life. That's inhumane. Um, so at one point, you know, if everything calms down. What so, age is he now? Huh? What age is he? He is from 77, November 77. So, so 44. Yeah. No, no, no. 46. He's turning 46 this year. 46. And you would get that wrong. Because I can't tell But I mean, but 46, you know, if he has a healthy, yeah. uh, I mean, we're talking 30, yeah. 30 plus years. Mm. That's a long time. But it's also a long time to keep your guard up. Yes. Uh, so I think you know what 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 um, you know people who work in, in. And I suppose that's before you think about who's coming under him or who's you know you look at Chapo El Chapo Guzman and uh, the sons and what's occurred there. Yeah. Um, so. Well, they're afraid of. I mean, the the government's <coughs> obviously afraid that um, something like that is going to happen. And, you know, uh, in the public case, you know, the case about against his nephew lawyer, um, the, the nephew lawyer got convicted for like five years in prison, um, being part of a criminal organization. And members of that criminal organization are two of his sons and a number of other, a uh, few more family members. So they're obviously worried about how that is going to develop. And I have to say, you know, you can be convicted as a member of a criminal organization, but not be, uh, sorry, you can, you know, if if somebody gets convicted for a criminal organization and there is a number of other members being named, it does not mean that you have to be prosecuted, you know. So you can be named as a member of a criminal organization and never get arrested or prosecuted. So that's possible. Um, but... It's obvious that they're afraid of, you know, how is this going to develop? And um, will his organization, as it was before he got arrested, will, I think people are convinced that it's not broken, that it's still functional. And what will happen once he, as, you know, the whole procedure, again, legal procedure against him is finished. What will happen then? And uh, I think, and I think in that sense, you know, we come back to the Kinans again. I wouldn't be surprised if they were really worried about that scenario. It's like um, European narcos, obviously. Yeah. But it's like series one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know, the next and the next and the next and. And there, yeah, and then there's you know um, what I always find. 
fascinating and scary at the same time is, you know, you know that the underlying business model of these kind of groups is out there. So, you know, I always, I'm a former finance reporter, so I always, you know, relate to numbers to, Dahi was uh, arrested in late 2019. In 2021 and in 2022, the ports of Rotterdam and Antwerp, who according to the authorities should be seen as one, and 80% of what is trafficked, drugs trafficked through Antwerp is for Dutch-rooted criminal organizations. But in those two years, a record amount of cocaine was intercepted 160,000 kilos each year. So you take one, you know, you take one of those suspected uh, ringleaders out, the business model doesn't stop. Uh, actually, it's in terms of interceptions, it's gotten worse. So the flow of cocaine is not becoming smaller, it's becoming bigger. Um, so the amount of money that can be made with trafficking cocaine is not getting smaller, it's getting bigger. The amount of people that I hear talking about using cocaine is not getting smaller, it's getting bigger. So that business model is there and it's going to stay there. And you wonder what has to happen for people to start connecting, joining the dots? What do you mean? Like for people to start joining the dots about taking it and the 100 quid going right up the chain, right into the pocket of Taggy and Kinahan. It doesn't seem to... No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And I don't think, at least, I can't speak for Ireland or other countries, but I think in this country, uh, that idea that people will feel responsible for, uh, you know, when they're doing drugs, mm. feeling responsible. I always compare it to, you know, you have a dinner party, you go to the supermarket, and uh, there's 10 people, and you need X amount of meat. And you look at the price of the bio chicken and you look at the price of regular chicken and you think ten, ten. most of us especially if I mean we cannot complain about our pockets but for people who have you know mm. don't have a lot of money they will go for mm-hmm. cheap chicken and that's the same thing I also you know I, I, I have teenage kids and when I I mean I talk a lot with people with politicians with people in the police and I always say, you know, listen, I talk to my kids and I know I can tell them not to do it. Don't do drugs. Don't, you know, uh, drink yourself uh, into a, a coma every weekend. Please don't. It's not good for you. But if you do use alcohol or drugs, you know, do it in an in a environment where you're comfortable, where you know people. If you do things that you've never done before, you know, if you drink gin, don't drink half a bottle, but drink one glass first. If you do an ecstasy pill, don't think, don't take a whole pill, take half a pill and be aware of that sometimes it could take an hour or maybe two before, you know, you feel the effects. That's how I, because I know I can tell them not to do it. Mm. And they point at me and when I'm at, with a beer in my hand, and what are you doing then? So, you know, that's a hard discussion. But then I talk about, I talk to all these people, politicians, and, and I say, listen, if you look from a point of view of money, if my kids are going to a festival, and I hope they do, and I hope they have a lot of fun, um, a beer is five euros, maybe six. A pill is also five euros, maybe ten. And a beer lasts them half an hour, an hour, and that pill is going to last them half a day. So... If you're that kid of 17 or 19, then what proposition are you going to take? And so you can say, don't do it. And, but it, we've been saying that for 50 years because it's illegal. Right, and it didn't help. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so, you know, I, I, so I, I'm, very, I'm very skeptical about So I'm, not, I'm a non-drug. I, I drink. I'm a non-drug user. I can, I can say for myself, I haven't smoked a joint. So the, I've been stoned once. I went to a festival, the Drum Rhythm Festival in Utrecht, like 30-some years ago. 
And there were so many people smoking weed and, and hashies that I got stoned. <laughs> and I found out the next day and I was like, I'm making coffee. And I was like, wow, this is a weird <laughs> smell. <laughs> so, but, um, so I can, you know, for, for me, it's not a thing. Uh, and I, I don't want to judge other people for whatever they do. It's, it's you know, I'm in that sense, I'm a real liberal. Um, but I do think, you know, we need something else. We, we mm. need like this. If we keep going, just talking about, you know, fighting this type of crime without like asking ourselves the, the question, you know, how are we going to deal with this? If this keeps getting worse and worse, how are we going to deal with this in 10 or 15 or 20 years? It's scary. Uh, it's really scary. And um, I, don't, I don't see, in my country, I don't see that. There is a, that debate is non-existent. And that's what worries me. And I'm, you know, also, like, you know, if you, there's people who say legalize. Um, I wish it was that simple. Yeah, but it's, it's not that not. simple. Because those people who are making millions and millions and millions of euros, because some politician says, you know, it's legal, they're not going to give up no, they're not. that money. So they're going to fight back. So you, it's not that simple. If you look at, you know, what's happening in the States with legalizing uh, uh, wheat and marijuana, um, former criminal organizations in states where it's legal fight back. And, you know, you can produce legally there, but... And also, what's, you know, they'll just move into another drug. Yeah. They're, all they do is that's what you see in the Mexican cartels, you know, as soon as they couldn't make... that The grow of uh, profit from cocaine was leveled out. Uh, they started crystal meth. Yeah. yeah. Then they started fentanyl. And, and look at what kind of problem the states... I mean... If you look at the number of people dying from an uh, an opium overdose in the states, I don't, I didn't look them up. But I think it's about a hundred thousand a year. I think a year, maybe even more. And it's like after heart disease and car accidents, it's the third cause of death statistically in the country. And I mean, you know, there is a whole story behind that as well. I know, but. You have to relate to this problem in a different way than just saying it's not allowed and we're going to prosecute everybody who sells it because it didn't bring us anywhere. We know. Uh, and that's something else in saying, you know, just legalize it because it's, well, as I said, as, as we probably agree, it's mm -hmm. a way more difficult than that. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, it's. How did we come here talking about Tachi? <laughs> well, we, you know, that's the thing, isn't it? You know, you start talking about these guys and you end up talking about the world because yeah. they're not just from the little community in Utrecht or wherever he was from. And the Kinnans are from a little part of Dublin, but they're actually this global phenomenon and it does bring the world together in all the bad ways. Yeah, that's, you know? well, that's one of the, the fascinating parts. Mm. How, you know, ethnic or national communities who have spread out all over the world... Um, They have managed to like make this web of relationships all over the world, and how they use that oh, yeah. uh, to their advantage. Because in that sense, you know, I mean, is there a country in the world where there is no Irish community uh, living there because they were looking for a better life? Uh, yeah, there's Dutchies all over the world. There's, there's no Moroccan borders for them. No. They just absolutely. I mean, but look, we won't solve it. But we'll go for dinner, will we? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> You've been listening to Crime World, a podcast from sundayworld.com. Produced by Ian Mullaney and edited by me, Nicola Talent. Research assistant is Claude Amini. If you like this show and love true crime, leave us a review. Or why not download the free sundayworld.com app for lots more stories from Ireland and across the globe.